Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. We're a few minutes after, but we're going to begin and jump into our kind of more informal discussion um, session for our Sunday school class. So let's pray. Lord, thanks for just another Sunday, another day where we can gather for worship. I thank you for each one of these people you've brought, for the joy it is to belong to your church. Uh, Lord Jesus, this congregation belongs to you. Um, Our resources belong to you. Our time belongs to you. Uh, We want to serve you well, and we know that what you call us to, in part, is to know you, love you, by seeking to understand your word. I pray that this would be not just an intellectual exercise, but an expression of our devotion to Christ, an expression of our, our zeal and our eagerness to understand your word so that we can submit to it, obey it, trust it, believe it, be shaped by it into who we are supposed to be. So Lord, give us wisdom and clear minds this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we have, well, this is the 50th week, isn't it? 49th. 49th. Stephen wanted to add one more lesson so that we could have a round 50. Um, But we've been 49, roughly 50 weeks of going through a doctrinal survey in our adult Sunday school class. So you could call it biblical doctrines, you could call it systematic theology, but it's an orderly, organized, working through um, what are the major questions that the Bible answers? Who is God? Um, What is salvation? Um, What's the Bible? Uh, what does the Bible teach about the end times? What does the Bible teach about the church? What does scripture teach about angels and demons? We've been going through in an orderly manner um, all of these different questions to try to give a somewhat comprehensive, although admittedly not exhaustive, uh, survey of what the Bible teaches on matters of doctrine and theology. So as many of you know, over the last four, five, six weeks, we've been going through last things, eschatology. We've covered personal eschatology, um, individuals' death, um, heaven, hell, resurrection, those things, judgment. We've talked about uh, cosmic eschatology, the return of Christ, what does the Bible teach about the millennial kingdom, um, questions about the rapture. We've tried to address the last few weeks, and we've scratched the surface on a lot of these things, um, but we've invited questions and feedback. And just as a reminder, uh, we're not claiming we can answer every question satisfactorily, but we're happy to engage those questions and try to offer uh, what we think the Bible teaches. And, and again, eschatology, just to remind us, some of the questions we've been talking about are not what we would call load-bearing walls of the Christian faith. So we can have different view on some of these matters, whereas there's other issues we've taught on, like who is Jesus? Is he just a man? Or is he fully God, fully man? You know, those questions are load-bearing walls. You take away the doctrine of Christ. You take away the doctrine of Scripture. You take away some of the different things we've taught on, and the whole thing comes down. But in matters of eschatology, there are some things you could call load-bearing walls. I think we could all agree that we are going to die. There is eternity, uh, either eternal joy or eternal judgment. Um, Jesus is coming back personally, physically, literally, to earth. Uh, Those things all faithful um, Orthodox Christians agree on. But then there's other things that get into the minutia, the details about the timing and the nature and and different very specific details we can agree to disagree on. Um, At our church, we have taken a view on some of those specific details, and they're in our statement of faith. So we're not afraid to talk about them. uh, We have taken a position, and we're going to teach those things. But just sort of giving some context in case you haven't been with us the last few weeks. Um, We're opening up for some questions. We've had a number of questions sent in, about four or five, and we won't get to all of those maybe in the same level of detail as what they're asked. Uh, But we want to address some of those, but also open it up to you guys. Just as a reminder, this could easily turn into a discussion group where we could share ideas and inputs and observations and comments, and that's what our small groups are for. And um, we do that on Wednesday nights, Thursday nights. A group this big is just too big to let everybody do that. So if you could help us, um, if there's any questions you have, ask those. We'll, we'll do our best to speak to those. And uh, we may repeat your question just for those who are, who are going to be watching or listening later. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first question. Here was a question that was sent in. Um, one of the things that we talked about in terms of fulfillment of promise Um, especially with God's promises about the kingdom, the kingdom that is coming, was that we suggested that there's a way to approach those promises that takes an already not yet kind of attitude towards the fulfillment of promise. And what I mean by that is that we, we suggested that there's some aspects of the kingdom that are already present, and there's other aspects of the kingdom that are not yet present, things that can't happen until Christ returns. 
Now there are, you know, that's kind of taking a certain position while there's others that would say everything to do with the kingdom is future, that there's nothing of the kingdom now, everything is future when Jesus comes back. And there's others that would say the kingdom is here in its fullness now, that everything's here and that Christ is reigning from heaven and we are the kingdom. And there's very little future uh, in that view of the kingdom. And we've taken an already not yet approach, which many people do. We just then fall into discussion of which things go in the already basket and which things go in the not yet basket. So here's the question. What are the implications of this already not yet approach to fulfillment? And I think the the questioner was asking in his email, um, what are sort of the practical ways this affects the ministry of the church? Um, If we think the kingdom is now, if we think it's later, if we sort of divide that up, what practical significance does that have? And I think there's a couple practical ways it does affect us, Uh, reasons why it's important we understand that the kingdom of God is already here in a sense, but there's many aspects of it that are still to come. I think we need to be careful not to understate the impact of Christ's current reign. Um, Jesus is the king of kings. He has risen from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has all power and authority given unto him. So we don't ever want to minimize that or, or, or understate that when we talk, about there's, we can talk about the aspects of the kingdom that are not yet in force. Um, I think that if we understand the current impact of Christ's reign, um, it helps us, it, it pushes us towards worship. It gives us a sense of confidence and uh, peace, even in the face of adversity and opposition to the gospel. So we want to triumphantly declare the kingship of Jesus Christ. And just because we think there's certain aspects of the kingdom not yet here, um, at the same time, we shouldn't understate um, and underemphasize the reality of Christ's current reign. Um, and on the flip side of that, we also want to be careful not to overstate what's already been accomplished. I think if we say that everything is now, we sort of dampen that expectation that we're supposed to have of Christ's coming reign. And we might start thinking that there's certain things the church is supposed to accomplish to bring about this kingdom. And so I think we have to keep these things in tension, that yes, Christ is reigning now, he's on the throne, but there are many things that are still to come, and we need to maintain this forward-looking expectation. And I think that also helps us to be at peace when we face adversity and when we face opposition, to say, yeah, this is how we thought it was going to be. But it's not always going to be like this. Christ is returning. So I do think there's practical aspects. Um, The kingdom is Christ's. Only he can establish it. Uh, We have to hold that in one hand. But also, let's not understate who Jesus is and what he's doing currently in his reign. So hopefully that speaks a little bit to that question about the already not yet aspect of fulfillment. Um, I want to open it up as well. Go ahead and raise your hand if you've got questions from the last several weeks about eschatology. I want to work through some of these but also open up for questions from you guys. So you can ask questions. Uh, Carrie taught on the eternal state, the new heavens, new earth. Stephen's done some teaching as well. So questions for any of us. What's the role of the raptured, glorified bodies church in the millennium? What is the role of the raptured church in the millennial kingdom? The With their glorified bodies. Very simply, they're going to reign with Christ. So we're under his rule, and then we're going to be his instruments to use to help influence his control over his kingdom. So we're going to be following his marching orders. But what, what more are you kind of asking? On earth, then. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you agreed. Agree. Yeah. yeah, I would say reigning with Christ, but also think about um, the testimony that will be You know, imagine preaching the gospel because we think there will be unbelievers who are born, obviously because there's a great rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom. Imagine the testimony to the gospel it would be to have glorified saints dwelling on the earth. Um, Living, walking proof, if Jesus being there isn't enough, of the power of the gospel. So I think it's a great uh, witness uh, in the world and a testimony to the glory of Christ. And we're also there um, worshiping our risen Savior. So reigning, worshiping, testifying, there's a number of different things we'll do. Think about this. We'll do many of the things that we're supposed to do now, but do them in a more perfect sense in terms of the church. And some of that bleeds into the eternal state. Carrie, maybe you could speak to that. that uh, I've heard one guy say that the millennial kingdom is like the front porch to the new heavens and the new earth. Um, so there's some things that are, that are similar that sort of escalate and ramp up into the eternal state. So maybe you could talk about just what that's like for 
resurrected, glorified bodies in, in the eternal state, the new heaven and the new earth. So the, uh, I guess the, the most clear passage that speaks to the eternal state of the believer in Revelation 21 and 22 says that they will reign with him forever and ever. And so um, I think what you're seeing um, to uh, a fuller degree in the millennium and then in its completeness in the eternal state is this restoration of the authority that God uh, gave to his creatures who are created in his image to exercise um, authority over his creation that you saw with Adam when he's, he is uh, naming the animals in the garden. And then that is coming back to fruition, um, beginning in the millennial reign of Christ uh, as we're serving under him and having authority in the world and then coming to its fullness in that um, eternal state where it says in Revelations that we will reign with him. That's good. Other questions? Okay, I'll get to one of these that was sent in. Uh, this is a specific question um, from 2 Thessalonians 2 and Matthew 24. It has to do with the rapture. So the question, I'm sort of summarizing and distilling this down. If the coming of the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2 and the abomination of desolation, which Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, if both of those things occur after the rapture, why do Jesus and Paul point them out? It's a good question, logical question. Um, and this question is sort of assuming that the reason for both of those references to the man of lawlessness, the abomination of desolation, uh, the questioner basically was assuming that um, that the reason was to urge perseverance and alertness, and that that would be the primary reason for bringing these out. So um, if you flip open to 2 Thessalonians 2, we'll just look at this real quick. Second Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, still with you, I told you these things? And we could keep going, but we'll stop right there. Um, so the assumption of the question is that the reason why the man of lawlessness and the rebellion would be pointed out is to warn believers, encourage them to be alert, to, to not be deceived by this, to be on guard, and to persevere through it. But it seems that Paul's reason for bringing this up is actually to encourage and to comfort the believers. If you look in verse 1, he gives sort of the topic, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. So I would take that gathering together to be the rapture of the church. He says, we ask you, brothers, and he doesn't say to be on guard or to persevere. He says, don't be shaken in mind. Don't be alarmed. Um, this seems to be meant to encourage and assure and to comfort the believers. He says, let no one deceive you. You see, someone might deceive them by saying that these things have already happened in the sense that they are entering into the day of the Lord. You would need to do a study on the day of the Lord throughout Scripture, but it's a it's a very ominous phrase. It has to do with great time of judgment on the earth. And these people were facing intense persecution and affliction. Um, if you look back in chapter 1, verse 4, and verse 3 and 4, it says they're giving thanks to God for these people. Uh, verse 4, they boast about them because of their steadfastness and faith and all their persecutions and the afflictions that they are enduring. Um, later on in chapter 1, he talks about those who are... Um, afflicting them and the judgment that's going to come on them in verse 6. So these people are facing intense persecution, intense opposition, intense suffering, and some had started to say, you know what, this is the day of the Lord. This is the great tribulation, and we're in the middle of it, and they were becoming unnerved by that, and Paul says, no, 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 you're not in the day of the Lord. This is not the great tribulation. Yes, what you're going through is intense, but 
This can't be the day of the Lord. Verse 3 says of chapter 2, that day, and that day is a reference to the phrase, the day of the Lord, that comes immediately before this in verse 2. That day, this time of great tribulation, the day of judgment, will not come unless the rebellion comes first, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So the point of this is not to urge them to be on guard against the Antichrist. The point is that you can't be in the great tribulation because these things haven't happened yet. Um, so the reason Paul's bringing it up is to encourage them, to comfort them. Say, yeah, what you're going through is tough, but it's not the great tribulation. Um, so I think that sort of explains Second, or Second Thessalonians 2. Um, in Matthew 24, though, there's also reference to this um, abomination of desolation. We can flip over to Matthew 24. <clears throat> Jesus tells the disciples that um, this beautiful, amazing temple is going to be destroyed within their generation. The disciples assume this must mean the world is ending. Um, to them, this means the day of the Lord must be upon them. So they ask Jesus, uh, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of these things? That's 24 verse 3. Um, and Matthew 24 does call for perseverance. It does uh, warn um, them to be on the lookout for certain things. Um, so the question is, why is Jesus pointing this out if the church is not going to face uh, this day of great tribulation that Jesus says is coming? Uh, the reason for this, uh, I think we have to understand the audience of Matthew 24. The audience matters. Um, let me look down in verse 15. It says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, and that's what our questioner was asking about, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So Jesus is, just set the context here, he's speaking to 12 Jewish disciples who believe in the Jewish scriptures, who are standing in the shadow of a Jewish temple, and Jesus mentions a Jewish prophecy from Daniel chapter 9 that talks about 70 weeks that are specifically 70 weeks that encapsulate the history and the, the destiny of the nation Israel. And the first 69 weeks had specifically to do with the history of Israel, and the 70th will also. And a key event of the 70th week is the abomination of desolation. And so when he says, let the reader understand, I believe Jesus is pointing back to Daniel and saying, remember, you know, what we're all familiar with back in Daniel chapter 9? Um, that's going to take place um, in this 70th week. So if there's this intense focus on Israel and this Jewish setting, there's Jewish scriptures, we can even look here in, in Matthew 24 and see that there's reference in verse 20 to the Sabbath. Um, and there's reference also to those who are in Judea. So this seems to be narrowly focused on an experience that will take place for the Jewish people during Daniel's 70th week. So I think I mentioned this briefly um, um, last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, I can't remember, that um, the Great Tribulation, the Day of the Lord, the 70th week, um, has much to do with, with Israel. Um, and you see reference here in Matthew 24 to the elect. And throughout Scripture, the elect often refers to this elect nation, this nation that God has selected from among all the peoples of the earth to be his instrument in the Old Testament through which he would bring his Messiah and accomplish his covenant purposes. So to, to bring all this back in, the questioner is asking, if Paul's talking about the man of lawlessness and Jesus is talking about the abomination of desolation, who, why would they bring that up if we as the church aren't going to be there? And I would say that because we as the church aren't necessarily in view in Daniel's 70th week. I think this has to do with the nation Israel. And the elect refers to them. And those who need to be on guard refers to them. And Paul encourages the, the Gentile mixture, this believing church, and says we're not going to be there during that time. Um, so I think that's why Paul and Jesus both bring up these details, is because it will be necessary for believing Jews during that period of time and others who come to faith during that time for tribulation saints. You want to add anything to that, Stephen? I know we talked about this at length over the last few weeks. So, yeah. Well, and I think beyond just the context of the audience, it's also just God's promise to do this. And so they're going to teach to say God's going to fulfill what he said he did too. Yes. So I think all of that kind of encapsulates. Yes. So any other questions about any of that or, or other matters that you guys have? Otherwise, we'll keep working through our list here.
It does seem like the disciples, too, are asking questions like that. So in Matthew 24, you know, verse 3, the disciples start this whole dialogue when they ask Jesus two questions. He says, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So it does seem like there's, there's topics, plural, um, that the disciples are bringing up, and Jesus addresses both. Yes, just to summarize for those who might be watching later, uh, Matthew 24, we would teach, is referring to there's a, a near perspective of what's going to happen in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple and a far-looking perspective on what's going to happen at the end of the age. There was a hand over here somewhere. Yes, the question is in Matthew 24, verses 13 and 14, I'll just read it. The one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, so does that mean that the evangeliz evangelization of the nations is a prerequisite for the return of Christ? Is that a fair summary of your, your question? Um, I would say yes, in a sense. So the disciples were thinking, okay, AD 70, the temple's destroyed. What more would need to happen before Christ would establish his kingdom and bring judgment? And Jesus says, well, I actually have the whole world in view. I want you guys to take this gospel around the world. Um, I don't think that's a overly literalistic sense that everyone in the world must be converted. Um, but I think if, and Stephen and I talked about this, if you were to go back and tell these guys who were sitting there in Jerusalem that day, that there would be people today in China, in the United States, in South America, all across Europe, in Africa, um, on islands throughout the Pacific and the Caribbean, worshiping Jesus, I think they'd be blown away. So I, I don't think, as some of our friends do, that it's, we have to make sure that, they're, that every nation has heard the gospel before Jesus can come back. Some people do see this as like a prerequisite. I would argue that this is already... Um, that this expectation has been met, that the gospel is not just in Judea anymore, and not even just Judea and Samaria. It's Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. That, I think that's happened. And I think what's helpful, too, is just textually, this isn't an if-then statement. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't say, if the gospel will, of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world, your job, your responsibility, then you will bring about the end. So I think even in the language of it, he's saying this will happen, then this will happen. So it's more of a timeline of what God's doing. What he's doing right now is spreading the gospel throughout the world. And that's what he's doing with his church. And he's saying when that phase of the project is done that I'm doing, this is what I'm going to do next. I'll bring about the end of all things. So... I think even in it, there's, there, you have to read in some sort of like cause and effect that the text really doesn't present. Yeah, in, um, in Luke uh, 21, which is a parallel passage to this, Jesus is talking to them, um, and he says that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Jesus is indicating that there's a time where Israel is not going to be the major player anymore. It's not going to be the, the center of where all the events are taking place. Um, but there's, a, there's an end to that coming. Um, when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, then there is going to be a restoration, and there is going to be um, some things happening that will change. So right now we're in that times of the Gentiles.
Yeah, so the question is, what, what's the expectation of a future temple? Is there a prerequisite that a physical temple be rebuilt in Jerusalem so that it can be defiled um, and, and some of these things are taking place? Um, <clears throat> that's a question that a lot of people answer differently. Um, is it, <clears throat> and I've heard some of those same things about, you know, people making preparations, tracing their lineage, that they have, you know, different furniture and blueprints and things like that, and if, if they could, you know, because current, in current day, uh, the Temple Mount is not under control um, by uh, <clears throat> the Israeli government. It's a, uh, it's, it's the Dome of the Rock, it's Palestinian owned and controlled, and it's an Islamic uh, center of worship for them. So, <clears throat> If the, if the Jewish people were to have possession of that, would they rebuild a temple? What all would happen? Some of that's hypotheticals. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and to me, whether it's currently in motion or whether it hasn't even started at all is besides the point. Again, we want to take our, our eschatology directly from Scripture and not try to read current events to inform <clears throat> our understanding of Scripture. I want my understanding of Scripture to help me understand current events. So whether that's happening or not, I don't see it as... Um, having an impact on any timeline or anything like that. Um, if there is going to be a future um, you know, physical temple that the Jewish people build that is then desecrated by, um, uh, you know, desecrated by the Antichrist, you know, how does that all come about? I'm not really sure. Um, if they start building it now, that fits and makes sense. And if they don't, I don't it doesn't really change my view because that could happen rather quickly at a future point. Yeah, so, and I'll ask you guys too, what value is there in getting super invested, drilling down into some of these, you know, very specific details about um, the temple and what's currently going on in Israel and how this fits into our eschatology? Any affirmations or cautions you would offer on that? Because I, I have a few. Um, I guess the only caution that I would add is that um, our Lord says, no man knows the hour and that the Father has not uh, revealed even to the Son when that will be. And so um, as interesting as it, as it may be, and if it, if it helps um, eschatology and Bible doctrine come to life in order to pay some attention to those things, um, then that, there's profit in that. Um, but if you, if you follow it to the point that you are beginning to believe, I have this figured out, and uh, I, I know what the timeline is starting to look like, then you've gone too far. And you've erred against, um, you know, what the Bible clearly teaches is that we, we cannot know. So that would be my only caution. Um, I would say similar. Um, one of the things that was kind of a new phrase for me that I think you mentioned in one of your lessons was newspaper theology. Was that it? Or newspaper? Newspaper exegesis. Newspaper exegesis. Yeah. So when we take current events and then we try to, like, paste it in on these verses, um, we're not, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. I mean, to really make it clear, like, we're just trying to know all things. Um, instead of being humble, like this text actually says, Revelation chapter 1, which is a common verse that's used for those that kind of get sucked in, they go in and they say, well, Revelation says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing um, that scripture talks about with studying the end times, with eschatology. And I think it's important to uphold that, to say it actually does say that, and there is blessing. When we look to a future hope that Christ promises and will deliver, um, what, what ends up falling off the cliff on the other side of it is when we try to add what this prophecy doesn't tell us. Um, when we try to add in and solve parts of the puzzle, like Carrie said, that, that we don't know the time or hour, we don't um, so it's, it's one of those things where we need to recognize it's proper and appropriate to study God's word. All of God's word is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Um, but when we get to the point where we're leaving scripture and going to conjecture um, to be able to piece something together that's really trying to provide hope apart from Christ, I think is what happens there. Um, and so recognizing like Christ needs to be my hope, not figuring out the puzzle. And that's the point of this prophecy. And so we want to direct people's hearts that direction um, and give them comfort where it's actually provided for us in Christ. I think when we start doing that, 
when we start reading current events and trying to fit everything together, what it, what it really is is speculation. Um, current events do not have the same authority as the Word of God. Our experience doesn't have the same authority as the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture. He doesn't promise to illuminate current events. Um, so it's to Scripture that we need to turn. And 1 Timothy 1, Paul gives a charge to Timothy um, to urge people, 1 Timothy 1.4, not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship of God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So I think we just need to be very cautious when it comes to speculation and discussing things that really vain means kind of empty and not that profitable. I don't think it's very profitable for us to spend a significant amount of time on this. Even the opening verses of Revelation tell us this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's about his glory. Mm -hmm. And we want to know about other things because it's interesting to us. We want to know what affects us. We need to focus on Christ. And if Revelation... And Daniel 9 and Matthew 24 are the pages in your Bible that have the most, you know, wrinkles and increases in them. I just encourage you to read some other passages and broaden things out a little bit. Other questions? To Connie. Just a comment. One of my uh, go-to verses when I'm thinking about speculation, I don't confess, but when I'm thinking about speculation, it's Proverbs 31, 21. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 31, 21. which is a reason why we read the whole Bible, because we're encouraged with verses like that. So other, other questions? I think we had one or two questions over here, and then I'll come, come back this way. Mark. Let's pray. Yes, we should pray for the salvation of Israel. We should pray for the salvation of all men. So we want to see Christ magnified. We want to see people saved. So let's not lose sight of that when we're trying to figure out all these details. And like Connie mentioned, let's be content to not know all the things that we might want to know and trust that God has this figured out. So I think we had, was there one other hand over here? And then Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, kind of the bookends, um, you started out with Thessalonians on the one hand, which was a comfort and the idea being, hey, don't, don't think you missed it. Um, and then on the other hand, in terms of the investigation and, and what you might know, what you might see in speculations and those sorts of things, um, he says in chapter 5, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And then he says later that it, that day won't overcome you like a thief, mm -hmm. for you are children of light, children of the day. And then he goes on to say, and I don't want to read it all, but he goes on to say basically turn the reader, mm -hmm. do what God has commanded you. Put on the armor of God, have faith, and, and live your life, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to um, what I think the other, opposite was, is be fearful Correct. Um, about what, what it might look like and whether we missed it, mm -hmm. and did, did we not understand. Yes. Yeah, he says, God has not destined us for wrath, verse 9. Verse 11, therefore encourage one, eno one another and build one another up. So that's the, the emphasis there. Well, I was just going to say that I think along with that, um, the wrong response to you know, recognizing that, well, we can't know the hour would be to become complacent or apathetic towards his return when that's the opposite of what that is supposed to mean for us. The Lord Jesus says in um, 
in Matthew 25, after, after talking about concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. Then in verse 13, he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Um, so that, I think, is the, is the right response to understanding we can speculate all we want. We won't figure out the hour. So it could be any time. Be ready. Be watching um, is what the Lord says. Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Which which passage are you in? Matthew 24. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So Matthew 24, uh, verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And this isn't just an eschatology question. This is something that unbelievers will sometimes bring up and say, look, Jesus couldn't cash all the checks he was writing. He said that these guys wouldn't die until the return of the Son of Man, and that didn't happen because we're still here. So this is even an objection to the integrity of the Gospels um, and to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So it's a text that everybody has to figure out if you're serious about studying the Bible and understanding the teaching of Jesus. And there's a number of ways people answer that question. Uh, one way, uh, one of my favorite pastors, teachers, um, would say that this generation simply refers to the generation alive at the time when all of these events trigger and start happening. That's not my view. Um, I actually disagree with him, but that's one solution. Uh, another solution is to say, if you're a preterist, that it all already happened and there's nothing future. Uh, that would be the preterist view. Preterist meaning, you know, all of this is historical, none of it's future. That the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 fulfilled everything in Matthew 24. And that in a sense, Jesus came back. Um, that's unbiblical as well. I would reject, re reject that view. Um, I think, uh, Jeremiah, if you were to go through this whole chapter, I would just encourage you, circle every time it says these things and every time it says those that day or, or those, those things. Um, there's sort of a discrepancy going on there. I think Jesus is speaking, like you mentioned earlier, uh, and, and I think you brought this up as well, Russell, of two different events, a near event and a far event. And I think if you go through and see that the disciples, whether they realized it or not, they might have thought they were asking one question. They're asking two questions. They want to know about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. They also want to know about the return of the Son of Man. And Jesus is parsing out both of these differently. And if you trace through these, these, these things, these things, uh, these things, and then that day, uh, um, in, in that day, those things, th Jesus is talking about two different topics. And then you come back and jump in here. Let's just read the verse before, verse 34. So also, when you see all these things, and I think these things, he's literally pointing at the temple, the stuff that's going to happen here. Um, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So I think that these things refers to narrowly to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's not necessarily saying everything I've just been talking about is going to happen in this generation. I think he's saying specifically the destruction of the temple. And if you want to study more on that, um, we have uh, the Expositor's Bible Commentary in our library, D.A. Carson's Commentary on Matthew, parses this out, and you can just literally kind of watch how he does that exegetical work of these, these, these things, these things, on that day, that day, you know, those things, and seems to be splitting that out. So that's how I would answer that question is, I think Jesus meant the destruction of the temple would happen within their generation, and it did. Um, but I would still hold that the other things, the other half of their question, is still future. So, and I think you can walk him, walk your friend through this whole chapter, take out a pencil and just circle all the all the little pointers, because there's clues right there in the text. Yeah, good question. All right, maybe time for one more very short question, and then we've got to wrap up. Okay, Courtney. So does scripture speak to or describe what daily life looks like in the new heaven, the new heaven, new earth? 
So Carrie taught us a little bit about this, how the world, the earth, is going to experience something similar to what our bodies experience, being made perfect, being made right. It's going to be a restoration and a completion of what Eden was supposed to be. So I'll let Carrie speak to that a little bit. Daily life in the new heaven. Daily new life in the new heaven. So um, I think that we are given sort of a glimpse. It's like the veil is sort of pulled away in, uh, in four different passages. So Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 1 Peter 3, and Revelations 21 and 22 all speak to um, the eternal state uh, of the believer in the presence of the Lord in um, the new heavens and the new earth. And so there's a surprising amount of detail when it comes to descriptions of um, the new Jerusalem. And I believe those are given to us as a, as, as a foil to this notion that we're talking about a, a, a state of mind or a metaphorical reality. It is a real place with real dimensions. Um, so those are given. Um, you also see descriptions of what that will be like by the, ab the absence of what we're told will not be there. Um, so there will be no more tears. There will be no more death. There will be no more sickness, no more wars. Um, Isaiah 65 talks about uh, the peace that's going to exist in that day and, um, and the safety that will be there. But beyond that, I think that the, the scriptures are, are deliberately silent because um, we're not glorified yet. Our minds are, are probably too far behind in terms of, uh, of the upgrades that would be necessary for us to really take any of that in. Um, and I think um, Connie really hit on it in the, the passage in Corinthians where it talks about no um, I hath not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the into the mind of man what God has prepared so there is a, there is an element of of revelation about that and then still a, a mystery that's there as well we do think it's going to be physical uh, I think there's going to be civilization and order and structure to society um, and it's going to be I think if we look at the Garden of Eden what Eden was supposed to be where there's work and there's you know, man functioning as he's supposed to in God's created world, that God hasn't given up on his plans from the Garden of Eden. He's going to bring it all to fruition. So I think it's going to be a good thing. We are out of time, so we've got to stop. Um, but we will see you guys back here in just a few minutes. If you've got other questions and you want to chat for five, six minutes, feel free to come up after this. Thank you, guys.